Take one. <laughs> take one. Take two. Take 53. All right. There we go. Sweet. So welcome to AKB, everybody. Today, we are going to be talking with Mr. Chris Godby. Hello. And, of course, we've got Robert Bogart here with us. Say hey, Robert. Hello. All right. So um, to kind of carry on with, uh, with the series that we've kind of started up, obviously, uh, we know each other from, from years back. Chris, I'm going to just kind of dive right in. Uh, okay. First of all, um, Congleton, Mr. Congleton says, hey. Of course. <laughs> and um, we, we, you and I, we have some history behind us where we all kind of got to know each other and things of that nature, uh, as well as John. Uh, that's where we all uh, seem to yeah. uh, know of each other's existence and stuff of that nature. Uh, I'm I'm just going to jump right in and basically ask you to give me a little bit of background about yourself. What what you what have you been up to here as of late? As of late, um, a little bit of Justin Timberlake, um, Timberland. Those are the the big name things that keep the bills paid, but it's also a lot of a lot of little grind. Okay. Um, there's still plenty of that to do. <laughs> oh yeah, and there is it fair to say that I know it is for me. Um, is it fair to say that I've heard it said before that yeah, the little grind is the thing that ac actually is might be the engine that drives the the race car when it's all said and done. You you get the big ones. Absolutely. You get the big ones, but those are maybe further and. Further between uh, the the big ones, maybe not for you necessarily, but for a guy like me, a guy my age, a guy that is, uh, shall we say, not on the go quite as much as I used to be when I was in my thirties. Right. right. Um, it's here comes kind of a loaded question. So I think. Um, I knew very little about you when we first met, and our, our first encounter was at a place called Dallas Sound Lab. Love that place. <laughs> Love that place myself. Um, Shout out Russell Whitaker. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Russell loves you, loves John. Um, I don't know if you know this, but I'm still rubbing elbows with Russell from time to time. Uh, yeah. I teach there at the school that he started many years ago. I went there to visit about a year ago. Um, you need to come by and visit sometime. Yeah, yeah. You know, give the, give some of the students something to maybe look forward to and maybe a little bit of wisdom along the way. They could use that. <laughs> yeah, wait, wait a minute now. Wait a minute. Now, um, with all due respect, um, you know, John asked me the same same thing about, you know, about students. Are they going to hear this? I said, well, I don't know if they are or not. They <laughs> don't pay attention in class, so why would they watch this? Um, however, uh, to be fair about the whole thing, I do have, I do have students that are uh, wanting to get into the industry. They're going to take it very seriously as they do. Um, but not to kind of cut you off. So I, I wanted to ask, so Timberlake, Timber, Timberlun, mm. excuse me, guys, I've got the hiccups already. Um, name some of the other large groups or people. Um, through Timberlun has been kind of a lot of connecting, like, um, you know, bit parts here and there with like a Jay-Z and Beyonce and Rihanna, like, um, nothing where I'm comfortable just, you know, notating them as worked with, you know, like a lot of these guys, you know, do one session. The next thing you know, you see a picture of them with, you know, Rihanna. It's like, I, I know all of their personal I engineers. I'm not, not one to take any, uh, you know, credit <laughs> for a lot of their stuff because, um, just cause I know their guys personally and I'm, I'm not, out there trying to promote myself as Rihanna's engineer. I mean, come on. Sure. Um, but, you know, I've mixed two songs for them. I mean, two is pretty good. <laughs> no, that's excellent. That's excellent. It's two more than I've ever done. 
Um, well, and I, I respect that. I respect no, that yeah, from yeah. the uh, from the vantage point that uh, a lot of a lot of people don't understand that we, and I, I I think I can say this as a global global thing. We as what I call trench people, the the folk who are in the in the control room, yeah. uh, behind the scenes, in a lot of cases, we're we're not necessarily after the the fame or the the glory of any of that. Oh, uh, we shouldn't be, at least. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, I, but however, I do consider us the right arm for the artist in a lot of cases. Uh, without folk like you, uh, sure. folk like Robert, like myself, like Sterling, like John. Um, the task becomes a daunting task, especially um, I've gotten myself into something here as of late. Robert and I were talking about this earlier, about it, it really sucks when you don't know how to do something and uh, you know what you want to do, but it it's not possible, or at least it's not an easy task when you don't know the uh, the ins and outs of how to do things. Right. What I'm talking about is, is basically, I'm not a video guy. Um, However, to keep this, you know, at a cost-effective way, here we are with a little GoPro that's shooting video of us right now, and we're actually recording into Pro Tools. Well, that has to be sunk back together. Yeah, That's kind of an easy part, at least for audio guys, it seems to be. But when it comes out to, you know, spitting out video with that audio and all the ratios that need to be involved with doing podcasts and things of that nature. Something as simple as dropping just the, the logo in there and having it a different right, resolution. Right. All like, that stuff. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, <laughs> so it's its own can of worms. <laughs> it's easy for me to say that, uh, you know, I spent a week on something that should have taken maybe a couple of hours to do. Wow. <laughs> so, um, back to back to you, um, John and I had talked about this uh, uh, when he was in town, uh, uh, talking about Pro Tools. So obviously, I'm an old school analog dude. You're an analog guy as well. Yeah. However. John and I both recognized that you were doing the Pro Tools thing way beyond, well past, well before we, he and I embraced it, well before lots of guys my age uh, that grew up in my, my age group, uh, before we ever embraced it. And you made it look so incredibly simple. Um, I guess the question that I would have for you, uh, did you understand when you were doing this, when you were kind of, if you will, kind of trailblazing the path down Pro Tools, that this was literally going to be where we wound up um, today? I'm not really sure about that. Um, obviously, working with a computer is not anything that I ever got into music to do, so... Um, a lot of the Pro Tools background actually came long before Pro Tools with like MIDI sequencing and arranging and like, you know, first it was a Atari 1040 ST uh, computer with MIDI in and out and sequencing on, I forget the software back in that day, but, yeah, um, you know, and even sequencing on synthesizers that had built-in sequencers like say a Korg M1 or something like that um, what that ingrained in my head was um, song form kind of things um, knowing that you know typically not all the time of course but you know you work in a four bar structure and and you've got you know four bars for for this part or maybe eight bars for that part and so um, a lot of my Pro Tools head was developed with knowing how to cut and paste and chop things inside of a sequencer. Okay. So um, I had Cakewalk 3.0 before there was any kind of audio attached to it, period. Um, we would work with a Simpty timecode stripe and... Um, we would record audio to, to a tape, mm -hmm. and we would run 
the sequencer with the tape, you know, running all kinds of whatever machines. Um, now I've lost my train of thought. But um, when Cakewalk, what what did they call it when they added audio to it? Cakewalk. Robert, I, I Cake, have to. Cakewalk audio. Mm, let's, I think maybe before I got into it, I don't know. I mean, that I was still up. in the realm of, you know, we're trying something here that, you know, it's new. We didn't really do it all that much. Like, I think I chopped up some drum loops or something in it. and Was it sonar? Would sequence to the drum loop, you know, and would do simple stuff like that. Um, but I don't think I saw the Pro Tools revolution as it is now. Like, it never even crossed my mind, actually. Like, all the tools were just a means to the end of of creating something with somebody trying to make something. And, mm -hmm. you know, this snowball called Pro Tools developed, and now we can have, you know, 500 some odd tracks and virtual instruments and... <laughs> Just all sorts of stuff. All at a fraction of the cost of what it used to be. <laughs> mm -hmm. It kind of started that way with me as well. I mean, I started in uh, Performer before it was Digital Performer. So it was sequencing yeah. uh, off of a little, they weren't even called IMAX back then. It was, I forget what they were called, but it was the, I called it the little toaster oven that one would carry around with you in, in a little case. And that's where you set stuff up. It had the yeah. little three and a half inch floppy disk that you stored <laughs> your sequences on. Right. Um, and we had samplers. I mean, you had, uh, at at one point, I remember distinctly, having a room full of samplers and, you know, yeah. keyboards and MIDI modules and stuff of that nature, which uh, they all served a, you know, a certain purpose. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and then it, then it switched over. One of the things that, um, not that it was terribly confusing, but one of the things that uh, kind of changed my way of thinking was when we went from MIDI to what they then called free MIDI, and it's like, what? How does this, you know, how does this correlate with what's going on? <laughs> well, you know, instead of having to have a MIDI cable with an interface that talks to the, all the boxes, yeah, you can do it all in the box now, and, uh, you know, depending on what kind of software that you have, blah, right. blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the uh, one of the things that I, I distinctly remember from back in the days of, of the Sound Lab when we first met was exactly that. I was still working on on an analog tape uh, quite quite heavily, um, and you've already spoken of it. Most everything was driven from uh, from uh, timecode from LTC, and uh, I, I believe on one of the one of the uh, podcasts that we've done, Sterling and I were talking about the uh, SBX80, the Roland SBX80 sync box. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, what an incredible box that was. And, of course, nowadays people don't necessarily have to think about that or, or worry about it per se. Yeah. Eight bars and loop it. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Sometimes less. <laughs> um, Just about drops in there. <laughs> definitely one of, the, one of the things that I remember so incredibly well was just how you made working in Pro Tools look like it was a cakewalk. And then, no pun intended here, but to make it look so incredibly simple, mm -hmm. but yet when I would sit down in front of it, of Pro Tools, I actually had a client or two go, you don't know this very well, do you? And it's like, no, nah, nah, I really don't. <laughs> uh, I'm learning as we go. Yeah, yeah, um, of course. But uh, you, you had a tendency to just make it look so incredibly easy. Well, I mean, even at, in the Sound Lab days, we were kind of using Pro Tools as just a, a tool. Like, we would dump tracks over to it and edit them and fly hooks and fix little things and then dump them back to tape. Mm -hmm. um, simply because, I mean, no nobody carried around their own hard drive in those days. They were like thousands of dollars. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. No, I, I distinctly remember, you know, a 35 gig... A 35 gig hard drive. If even that. 1,500 like, bucks. Like, like eight gigs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and then we would just dump edited tracks back to tape. Um, 
and that was the way we we were using Pro Tools then. But um, yeah, just the whole making it look e easy part wasn't really just knowing Pro Tools. It was just knowing about how to put a song together. <laughs> okay. Now, let me ask you, I don't want to say this is more technical, uh, but maybe from the uh, viewpoint of you obviously had to capture stuff along the way too. So let's say, um, I, I think I remember you telling me that in some cases, uh, sometimes your job was to take something that had been recorded mm -hmm. and getting it into a, a, shall we say, a sequence that actually made sense. Right, right. So involved with all of that means that you've got a microphone out in the room or microphones out in the room capturing this stuff as well. Um, John Congleton has, you know, a different perspective of things than than me sure. when it comes to to certain things uh we when he was in town we had talked about what i call minimalistic recording techniques meaning fewer microphones let's say it's on a drum kit i was kind of raised with the uh with the uh shall we say the nashville mentality of you know you're gonna mic everything and in some cases you're gonna double mic everything right um <laughs> And, and things of that nature. So I guess my question to you would be, um, when it comes to miking techniques or things of that nature, what is, what is your thoughts on um, if, if you're using it for, let's say, a sample or something of that nature, what are your thoughts on, on the capturing of those sounds? Mm, well, these days I pretty much just capture vocals. <laughs> so, okay. Um, the occasional instrument gets put in, but um, um, I know John's much more of a microphone guy than me just because he needs to use them more. But um, just record a, a quality instrument, if possible, um, is probably a pretty good thing to say. Start, um, yeah. There's so much emphasis now on oh, you can fix it with this plugin, or mm -hmm. you can fix it with that plugin. Or, okay, let's know, talk about that for a all, second. All How do you feel of, about that? I mean, I feel like it's all great, and I do all of that stuff, but I, I feel like um, there's so much YouTube crap, and I mean, some not crap. I mean, there's a lot of really good information out there, but um, I think it puts people at a disadvantage in their mind when they feel like they need all of that stuff to do something well said um yeah. you don't need any of that stuff you, you need a talented person to record and if it's yourself then you know you need a an idea and you know recording it with an sm7 is fine <laughs> sure um Okay. Uh, no, I'm smiling about that because John and I have this whole thing. He, uh, he had done an interview at one point, and he actually brought, brought my name up. And it had something to do with using SM7s, not SM7s. 57s. 57s yeah, yeah, uh, for everything that was going on. And uh, as a joke, we were kind of thinking about putting a, a 57 in front of him when we did <laughs> did our discussion with him about that whole thing. And, and that, he freaking hates them. I and, mean, he, and that would have been fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. See, that's my my take on it too. Put a 57 on it; it'll work. It'll yeah. it'll work great. Of course. Um, I think he specifically said he just does not like the way that mic sounds. Well, it is very direct, very similar to what the uh, SM7Bs do for us vocally. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I would I would say some of the up and comers that that are coming through school now. There's this whole there's this whole thing about uh, there are certain things that can be taught in school. There's certain things that just you're going to have to experience it to yeah, kind of get sure. the get the gist of. Yeah how to use it, what to use, so on and so forth. Um, but the comment that John was making was like, yeah, you had 57s on every instrument that was out there. And it's like, <laughs> it's probably because that's all I had, you know? Right. <laughs> um, or it might have been some percussion something or another where, you know, having a bunch of condensers just wasn't going to work for, yeah. the, for the situation. Um, 
but um, I, so let's let's talk about that for a second. Uh, I, I think that we all kind of agree, uh, in, including John. We we got into the discussion about you know Pro Tools, plugins, all the things that can be done with all of that, which is great. I, I think that we all feel like. Uh, um, it, it's great to have that there, but it's Absolutely. still just a tool, right? Yeah, it it shouldn't sure. be necessarily the be all end all. No, yeah. Uh, you really shouldn't ever go into a, a recording session thinking, "Hey, I'll fix this later," because no. sometimes it doesn't work out. I mean, yeah. But and um, and sometimes you fix it later, but <laughs> sometimes you fix it later. Yeah. Um, w one of the things that I try to get across to these uh, these students, and and by the way, you know, some of them are 19 years old, some of them are in their 50s, and they go, "There's got to be a better way of life than you know driving a truck or working for X Y Z, uh, you know, making making 10 bucks an hour." And uh, I've occasionally been asked, "It's like, what's it what's it like? What's it feel like to be successful?" And I'm going. I don't right. know the definition of I'm, that. I'm because, still trying to figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, successful to me is being able to get up out of bed of a morning no, sometimes. Yeah. Successful is saying that you've reached your goal, and I definitely don't feel like I've I've reached a goal. <laughs> so Yeah. And I I think uh we all feel that way. You know, if if you ever accomplish that goal, there's always gonna be another oh, goal yeah, to, to to go for. Um I'm not real sure what drives that boat, so to speak. Um, but I think most of us feel that, um, yeah, if I've accomplished this, it's not what I've done in the past, but it's what I'm going to do in the future or what I have down the road that I would like to, like to go do. And so having said that, um, I'm going to ask you once again, kind of a loaded question. What are <laughs> what are some of your goals for the future? Um, just to keep paying my bills without having to answer to too many people. Okay. Um, and to I don't know to work on something that I feel like I put myself into a little bit, and um, I'm accountable for for what I do. Um, I'm not hidden behind a a bigger process or a company or mm -hmm. um, you know fulfilling someone else's goal. Like I'm, I ultimately just want to create music or mix music and uh, keep paying my bills that way. <laughs> sure. Um, let me ask you this again. Most of these questions are going to be kind of loaded questions, mm. and you can answer them however you feel. <laughs> you don't have to. You don't have to. You know, this is down and dirty. Yeah. We are putting this out there, and and for what it's worth, I've I've actually had a couple of uh, college uh, instructors in the recording arts program go. I would love to use the podcast to present to my students um, because they need to understand that there's not a formula. It's not like going no, to school no. to learn how to be in accountants don't take this the wrong way, but it's not like going to school and you learn this formula of how to be a great right. accountant. And it's even less so now with, I mean, there's not a recording studio per se where you're just going to get a job and people are just going to hand you sessions. Like you've got to find people that like you. <laughs> that's, that's wow. That, well put. That's pretty much what it is. Um, I had a train of thought there I was going to go with, but, um, yeah, that there's so much instruction, like parallel compress your kick drum and do all this stuff on YouTube and let's learn how to, you know, make your vocals sound like the weekend or whatever. And like, nobody seems to be teaching. Well, here's how you make people like you <laughs> and oh, wow. want to yeah. work with you. And, um, yeah. I think that's missing. <laughs> yeah, well put. Well put. Um, <laughs> I think all of the people that I know, all of the people that I respect, uh, pretty much feel the same way. It, it absolutely um, is one of the things that uh, Winfield brought up is that 
some of the things that can't be taught in school is how to uh, how to be the ultimate professional. Right, right, how right. to look, maybe how to how to address people when they enter the room, so on and so forth. Um, uh, Dave Pensado. I don't know if you know Dave. I met Dave yeah. through a friend of ours through Bobby Sparks. Yeah. Uh, years ago, this was out on Kirk Franklin's uh, New Nation record. Yeah. yeah. Uh, got introduced to Dave, and uh, Dave had a, a something a real interesting viewpoint that I'd never heard before. Here, Dave Pensado is. I I knew who he was, and I knew you know some of the some of the people that he had worked with and he got off onto a uh, subject matter talking about um the treatment of clientele right right and um what he was saying about that whole thing was look i i will pick up my shop wherever that might be and i will move it if i find out that any particular studio is treating uh, this client that may be a no-name person. In other words, no one really knows who they are right. and treats them differently than they would, say, a Michael Jackson or pick your, pick your celebrity. Yeah, yeah. He goes, you know, if I find out that that person is being treated any differently, that's when I pick up shop and I will move it to another facility. And it has everything to do with knowing how to how to treat people. They're paying the same rate that anybody else is going to be paying, so on and so forth. And I've I've actually uh, uh, I've had an example of that would be um, I had a client. This is once again this was years ago. Uh, we were going into a mastering house in Nashville. Made made the trip up to Nashville, and I had told my client already. I go now listen. We're walking into a very, very professional environment. Uh, the guy who's actually going to be doing the mastering for us, we should consider this very fortunate on our end to have him do this. But you got to bear in mind, you're paying exactly the same rate that any uh, label would pay right. to have this work done or any artist who's well-known would pay to have this done. And so whatever you do, don't ask the question, are we getting the same treatment that, say, so-and-so, so-and-so <laughs> would get? And um, lo and behold, that question got brought up mm -hmm. while in the mastering session. And I think it's fair to say that it changed my the, the mastering engineer's viewpoint of this person when that person asked that question. Right. <laughs> because it was a stupid question. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and he let him know. He goes, you know, I treat every project as though it's my own. That's a that's good, what yeah, I'm uh, here for. I mean, that's the way you get from from here to there, kind of. Uh, I think so too. I've stayed up all night for someone else's project, countless numbers of times. <laughs> sure, and I think uh, I've worked on projects that I don't even like personally but i still treat them like you know i've got to get this exactly right sure is it fair to ask i'm fair or not i'm gonna ask it <laughs> um do you find yourself even if you don't really care for the project for me i still find myself i i definitely want to be the ultimate professional through all of, of it yeah um but i can find ways to get myself into the project it could be the simplest of things absolutely um maybe it's you know i want to make for sure that the consonant closes off when it's supposed to all oh, right it could be M mouth clicks anything. um you know kind of sounds or, sure um you know if the singer doesn't have any kind of mic technique and they sing uh, you know it's not always a it's not always a plug-in that fixes that sometimes it's actually <laughs> you know yeah doing something an actual different. movement of right. some sort mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> no I, i've been finding that to be true as well um just it may not always be my cup of tea so to speak no yeah yeah but there's always something 
driving, you know, you to care about it. <laughs> Do you consider it a, a creative process? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Of course. <laughs> Once again, I'm I'm just smiling about it because I I totally do, and no, yeah. you know, so few people get to experience um, what we as as engineers, as producers, get to experience sometimes, and um, a a lot of times as I as I watch these newcomers come into the industry, I, of course, as as students coming in, mm. I I will always ask my class before we start in for 15 weeks. For a lot of them, it's an oh moment because it's like, oh man, I, I just like music. Well, that's great. I think, you know, music yeah. is a great thing for all of us to have <laughs> in our lives. Mm -hmm. But just because I like it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be great at this. Not unless you really find yourself getting involved with it at a much deeper, yeah, yeah. I deeper mean, level. I you, mean, you've really got to have another kind of love for music almost to the point where at the end of the day you kind of kind of hate music <laughs> but okay fair um, enough um but it's gosh man um i think a lot of students that go to these places just want to learn techniques to further their own music which is which is a fine thing to do Sure. But that's different than actually becoming an engineer or a mixer working on a bunch of other people's music. Because mm -hmm. um, if you're only passionate about your own projects, then, I mean, what are you in school for? Kind of sounds like somebody going to architect school to just to build their own house right, or something. Right, like why, exactly. But Very I think perfect. it happens. <laughs> Oh, it definitely I, I, I think it. I, I definitely think it happens. I see uh, not not everybody, but I yeah, see yeah. a lot of that going on, and especially today, because let's face it, um, you know, it, it's been said by everybody who's been doing this for a lengthy period of time, which you have, I have, mm -hmm. Sterling has, Congleton has, uh, and we'll as as these podcasts grow with the various people who have been in the industry for you know 25 30 40 years um the the days of working at a recording studio you're a hired gun specifically to do the things it's it's yeah very I mean, much like it was when you and i met right i think, I think that went out with the sound lab didn't it it pretty that, much did at least here locally it. it did yeah um <laughs> I think there have been a few facilities that have tried. Um, I don't know if you were ever... Uh, did you ever make your way over to Harbor House Studios? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that might have been the last room, the last recording facility that their intention was, look, we're going to have a... We're going to have a chief engineer here and, uh, you know, everything that darkens the doorstep you'll have the ability to go, yeah, I'm going to do that. Or, you know, maybe I'm not the best guy to do that. Right. Um, but those days are over. I mean, they, the way I see it, I mean, you've got a handful probably across the country that actually have house engineers um, on call. Oh, yeah. And e even all the major facilities that I go to, it's um, engineers are... Are, are brought in and mm -hmm. the assistant engineer at the place is, you know, you know, no knock on them, but they take food orders. Yeah. And I've had some really great assistants that are really great assistants and also have to take food orders. <laughs> sure. No, it was, um, it was very much that way, you know, 20 years ago on, uh, I brought up Kurt, uh, the new nation project. So I, I had an assistant out there and of course this was before you took on, uh, uh, took on Kirk Franklin projects. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I had an assistant out there uh, left his left his family in in Beirut. Uh, was going to have a very good life. Uh, his father was very well to do, and uh, his father couldn't understand why he would want to pick up and move to Los Angeles, making minimum wage in Los right. Angeles. That's a very hard road. 
And yet at the same time, um, this guy, one day when we were alone, this was when everybody else had cleared the building. And he goes, man, I hope you come back and do more work here. And I'm going, why? I'm just some, you know, I'm just some a-hole out of, yeah. out of Texas <laughs> that, you know, I've just got fortunate enough to get to be on this. Yeah. And uh, why, why do you say that? And he goes, because you're nice. You, you treat me well. Oh, yeah, yeah. I get that. <laughs> and um, it, in, a, in a roundabout way, it broke my heart because it's like, what do you mean? Uh, is there anybody in this bunch who's talking down to you? Or are they treating you less than what you should be treated as a, as a human being? He goes, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. But you have to understand you're in Los Angeles. And I see all kinds of projects. And there are things that you know I get talked down to quite a lot, so on and so forth. Um, I guess my point is, is that this guy, I, I wouldn't have been able to do those sessions that I did. I was out there for uh, a little over a month every day. Mm -hmm. And this is no strange thing to you. This yeah. is something that, that you have done for years yeah. on a regular basis. Uh, but I could not have gone through what I went through without that guy there. And uh, it, it's very fair to say that I went on to do a couple of other projects same facility by the way this facility didn't exist anymore it was the enterprise enterprise yeah um and uh this guy wanted me to once again i don't understand why he was wanting me to take a listen to it but it was like would you just take a listen to some of the work that i've done and it was amazing it was simply amazing and i could not have made it through my sessions my days my month without that guy there and yet he was the assistant that was there. Right. And lo and behold, I want to say it was probably, it, it couldn't have been much more than a few more months later on. I'm reading about this very same guy in Mix Magazine, you know. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not, not to say that it, it happens for everybody, but those who pay their due diligence and put their heads down and take, take the when it comes yeah. their way yeah. and goes, yeah, this is just a part of the gig. Um, I, I, I want to say, and a lot of times Robert and I, we have to talk ourselves off the ledge because I'm, I'm just at that age now to where it's like, I, I really don't have a whole lot of time for, to put up with people's crap. Right. Or, sure not. I probably have the time for it. It's just where I am in life. I don't want to. <laughs> right. Um, well, it goes back to the importance of, you know, liking the people you're working with and being around. I, I like most of the people I'm around on a, on a daily basis. Um, I wouldn't be there if I didn't. Right. But there are those moments where you kind of go, really, are we about to go down this path that... I thought we had discussed and um, okay, you know, if that's the path that you choose, um, who am I to say no to that? Because it's going to be putting money in my bank account somehow, some way, <laughs> you know, um, and I, I've had to be pulled in off the ledge a time or two. It's like, look, you need to stop thinking like that. You just, yeah, you know, yeah. I, just I, I can go. get pretty negative. Um, that might be why I have all these therapy devices behind me. <laughs> I love uh, that. <laughs> the wall therapy of therapy. Because that's exactly what they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Um, but I don't know. You can never, I would never just, you know, disregard somebody that's, you know, trying to make music in any way because you never know, you know, it's not just me trying to get from point A to point A. Like you, you work with people along the way, and if you connect with somebody, you know, maybe on a little bit of different path, and then all of a sudden they get somewhere. If, if you've treated that person well and they like you, and then all of a sudden they're connected to some kind of big gig, then maybe you'll get the call because you were the nice guy that put up with a bunch of bullshit. No, no, <laughs> you're right on point with that as far as I'm concerned. I think you're experiencing a little bit of that yourself, Robert, you know, just. Yeah. There's uh, definitely questions like, why am, am I really doing the right thing here? Should I be, you know, sticking through this? But 
you know, I guess I've been doing this like uh, six years, but I can say there's been moments where when I finally push through something, I can look back on it and say, you know, I'm glad I, I kept with it, stuck with it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, w- without, without question. Um, so let me ask you this. You, you mentioned this as therapy for, for you. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> I want to get off on a little tangent about that. So one of our first podcasts out there was what we, I, I'm trying to create, a, um, what is the word I'm looking for where it's initials instead of full words? Acronym. Acronyms. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> See, that's why I keep him around is yeah. my memory for him. Yeah. Um, no, um, BTRs, built to record facilities, such as the Sound Lab, right? Uh, such as Harbor House, such as uh, um, Sonic Ranch. Love that place. Me too. You might recognize it. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, it's kind I of the same do. vibe. Does it feel a little bit? Very, uh, very, yeah, no, very cool yeah. vibe. Yeah, I've tried to um, absorb the things I like about places. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so one of the things that we talked about the first one that we had put out was what we call BTRs versus home recording studios. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously this is a little bit more than what I would consider a home studio, even though yeah, it's located yeah. at your home. You're right. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on, what are your thoughts on, because I have several people who, potentially would listen to this. I had one friend um, who actually went through school and he he sent me a little text message after he had heard the first podcast and he goes, now wait a minute. Um, you know, what do you have to say about guys who gave up a $60,000 a year job to be at home at his home recording studio? And I went, well... Uh, we were just coming up with pros and cons of each, you know, the pros of being at a, at a recording studio, Mm -hmm. such as like for me, uh, I like having a place that I get in my car and go because I'm able to leave it there. If I'm working on someone else's stuff, I'm able to leave it there when I leave at the end of the day. Right. Uh, as opposed to my wife knows me very well. Uh, we went through some some difficult stuff because I had a home studio. Now, once again, it's nothing like this, but I I always felt drawn to it. This is not in my home per se. Mm -hmm. And that, that was kind of a big selling point to this place when I got here is, you know, I didn't like the, this is enough separation for me to walk out the back door and walk into this building and, you know, that's separated enough. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I can kind of leave stuff here, but I'm always available should something come up because, man, there's so many. Like, this was born out of necessity, not this is better than that or anything. Like, mm-hmm. so much um, work has just come up from, um, you know, working inside Pro Tools and having everything living in the box. So, you'll get calls to do like little things that might only take you like a half an hour. So Mm -hmm. it makes it real easy for me to just go, okay, you want to, you know, you want a stem of your cowbell without the reverb. Uh, I can just run in here and do that real quick. Sure. Fire it off and then be on with the rest of my day. (laughs) No, that great point. Great point. Um, The, some of the things that we were talking about, uh, now, once again, not not the same because it was in my house, but for for me, yeah, I always felt drawn to it. So that that would be my next question: Do you feel do you feel drawn to this on a daily basis? In oh, other yeah. words, do you feel like, look, I need to go spend, even if it is a half hour, fifteen minutes, an hour. For me, it was always, you know, it was always six, eight, yeah, yeah, yeah. eight hours in this little room. Right. <laughs> and that led to, you know, some problems. Uh, my wife's pretty understanding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, she, uh, yeah, God bless her. <laughs> I think we've all 
all said something to that effect. <laughs> um, Sterling has has a studio in inside his house as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we all acknowledge that. Yeah, it takes a special person to be able to put up with us, as it were. Mm-hmm. Um, it took years for my wife to understand. You know, hey, this is who I am, mm. and um, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that I love you or the kids any less. It's just you have to understand that uh, this was born inside of me. I learned this at a fairly early age, yeah. and it's really hard for me to, for anyone to ask me, hey, you need to put that down, come in and eat dinner, per se. <laughs> right. you know? And it's like, well, I'll be right there. Uh, you know, Three hours later, I show up for dinner, which you uh, know, everyone else is going to bed. I eat many of meals right there. Mm-hmm. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, on a slightly different note, and one of the things that, and I don't know that I necessarily explained this to you beforehand, but we try to keep these podcasts non-technical, and we do that for a reason, because it's it's there, more about there's enough, human beings. There's enough technical stuff. Just go on YouTube and search for what you yeah, need. Exactly. search for whatever you want and you can find it (laughs) that being said though i'm sitting over here and i'm looking which is off camera but i'm looking at an s3 okay yeah and you made the comment yeah i use it for metering basically (laughs) so um this is going to lead once again kind of not a loaded question but maybe even a loaded comment i've i've made this comment over and over and over um there at the school i go look you know um, it's, it's a nice thing to have, yeah, yeah. especially if you want to have, you know, faders in front mm-hmm. of you, uh, maybe a pan knob. Mm-hmm. Um, but my take on where technology is today is that there, there are so much bells and whistles, so much bling that's attached to something like that, yeah, that yeah. sometimes for me, it gets in the way, especially, uh, especially with pro tools. Because 90, I think it's very fair to say 99.5% of everything that I do now in Pro Tools in post-production. I'm dealing with, I'm dealing with picture and sound to picture in what I teach. Um, but everything is doable via a shortcut. How much shortcuts are you doing these days? On the S3? Mm, I think Tim's asking in Pro Tools. I don't know if there is shortcuts. There's just buttons that do things. Uh, <laughs> well put. I mean, what 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 am I actually cutting? <laughs> sure. Short. <laughs> like, there's nothing that I'm cutting short. There. Um. I mean, copy paste. Or, you know, duplicating your automation moves. Maybe. Uh, I don't really know what a shortcut is <laughs> oh i bet you do you just don't call no it yeah that. well i mean I guess I shift command i gets used a lot import audio import audio import session data zooming in and out yeah the r and t mm-hmm. um, exporting audio consolidating a region bouncing to this do you do do you do most of that on the s3 or do you do that i don't from touch the that s3 honestly like uh, Aside from like a mute button and maybe getting an idea, um, just because you're never gonna get the fader move exactly right, mm-hmm. um, and nine times out of ten I got delay compensation working so hard, like my my fader move isn't even where it's necessarily supposed to be. Gotcha. So even when I do end up doing a move on that thing, I go back and have to tweak Clean it, it anyway. Yeah. And then like. Then it's a question of, well, am I going to automate that all with the fader or am I going to do some clip gain work, which I do more and more these days? Okay. Um, am I going to dump the vocal into Melodyne and like fix it that way? Like it goes beyond just moving the fader up and down. Um, but that said, it is a handy meter because I, I, I can see tracks that maybe aren't on screen. Mm-hmm. Um, I do use the mute buttons now and again, just, you know to facilitate okay this is that or this is that and then then i'll just go to it on screen <laughs> um they should just release a, a box that's meters mutant solo buttons yeah 
<laughs> but, but, they, uh, but they have that in Pro Tools. I use yeah. that kind of when I when I track my toys. I, I've got a template where, you know, I, I I can get sound out of any one of these things like in a second. So, um, I can, you know, see meter from across the room or whatever. Um, turn it up and down maybe just a little bit, but like doing actual moves and feeling like I have to mix on the thing. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> have you ever felt like, because I have, I, I do yes. remember, you know, 20 some odd <laughs> years ago I think, I think where I it's like, where oh, you're going. going to be mixing this one in the box. And it's like, I, I really yeah, need faders. There was a time, there, there was a time, but you can, you can resist and not get work and make it hard on yourself or you can evolve and just, um, figure out how to, you know, figure out how to do it where you like it. And well because said. the console, gosh, I, I find them handy for tracking lots of musicians. Mm -hmm. Um, I would still, you know, prefer if I was tracking a full band to have a console there, of course, but, um, working on a mix, I've, I've fully embraced this just because no one's paying me extra to, to make it harder. <laughs> well uh, put. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I, I could not have said that any, any better. And, um, no, it, it definitely reflects how I feel about things. Mm -hmm. Where I was going with, with all of that is that, um, there's, there's, uh, I, I do. I tell my students a whole lot. Don't let this bling get in the way because no. you know you got to remember. Probably in five years, this is going to be a boat anchor like a lot of the stuff that we've all owned at some point or another, right. and it becomes uh, it becomes a thing of the past. And so if you if you totally embrace it and you get to that point to where you can't live without it, you're going to be in for a surprise a little a few years down the road. Oh yeah. Uh, of which you're going to have to relearn everything. I, one of the ones that comes to mind was the, uh, I guess, the C24. Uh, when Harbor House had the C24 there. Mm -hmm. And I got to learn that thing in and out in all different kinds of ways. And I, I literally painted myself into a corner with that thing. It's like, I don't know how to function without it now. And lo and behold, um, it wasn't until actually I started teaching uh i had a mentor who who i'd rubbed elbows with many many years before that that um he goes look you know in post-production which first of all we're talking about two different things we're talking about post-production for for film mixing in 5.1 uh as opposed to recording a band or recording an artist for for uh, the purposes of generating music. Um, he was the one who pulled me out of that whole console way of doing things, especially once it's been captured. And I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm very much like you. If, if I'm going to be recording the band, I much prefer, you know, a large format console, if at all possible. Yeah, of course. And, uh, you know, using, using the tools that we have in front of us, or maybe in some cases behind us. Um, but I think where I was going with with a control surface in most of the um, and I'm not calling you old by any stretch of the imagination. I'm but forty three, so I'm getting there. <laughs> um, I'm old compared. <laughs> I don't even know that I can can, can call you old school. I, I think I can because you were you were. I right think you were John, using tape. I don't know if John, I think me and John have talked about this a lot. Like we really feel like. We were the last ones off that Jurassic Park when it was all blowing up. Yeah. It's like everything from now has changed. Jurassic Park is gone, but we're in the helicopter just looking back at it. and like, Wow. wow. We, that, we, that's a great analogy. We were there. <laughs> we were there. We're not there now. We're not Thank there God. now. <laughs> <laughs> now, there, there is a, there is a, I don't want to say love hate, but there is definitely a, uh, um, there are those who refuse to embrace the technology, and you said it yourself yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that you can you can either fight it and not have work, 
mm-hmm. or you can learn to embrace it and get on boat, get on board with it, get on the boat. And uh, most of the guys that are that are even older than I am that that have uh, learned to embrace it, they go, you know, I wouldn't trade, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world, especially when it comes to editing, when it comes to being able to spit stuff out very quickly to get it across the country or literally across the world in yeah. a period of time that is seconds compared to days or weeks. Uh, we got into a discussion, uh, this would be Sterling and I, uh, back on on some Merciful Fate records that were done. And yeah. we had a guest appearance by Lars Ulrich. And he wanted to hear rough mixes. Well, the only way to do that was to put that on a DAT tape, put it in snail mail, and figure out where his itinerary was going to take him <laughs> and literally have it sent off days before it was supposed to, you know, to get there so that it could catch up with him. He would listen to it, call us on the phone at an exorbitant um, price, you know, yeah, yeah. and go, hey, I need for you guys to make these changes. Literally go in, make the changes within an hour, and sit on our butts for the next four days, you know, waiting to hear back. That's now, nice. I didn't mind that all that much that's because good, I was on the clock. That's a good way to work. Right yeah. <laughs> I was digging it. Um, but big big difference. And like, like you said, uh, you, you either have to get on board with it or you're not going to be working. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I think to a certain extent, um, I drug my feet as long as I could. And I started realizing, look, you know, the, the days of, first of all, analog is probably not going to come back. If it does, it's, it's going to be few and far between. There are machines still out there, but they're selling for pennies on the dollar of what they used to, used to cost. Um, and even if you do use it, you record a take to it and then just dump it straight into tools. Mm-hmm. Yep. Or you no, know, well put. You, you, I've never used one, but that whole uh, the analog clasp thing. You've mm-hmm. you've seen that thing. Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean that's kind of the same idea. Sure. I guess your your audio hits the tape, but yeah. Chris Bell Chris Bell used one over at Blade Studios. H- had you ever been over to Blade uh-huh. over in Shreveport? No. Um, Chris isn't there any longer. Yeah, um, I talked to him about a year ago. So. Did you? Um, uh, this might not be, you know, for us here, but <laughs> uh, I was visiting Russell. Okay. And um, Harley has his little shot next door, right? Right. And Russell's like, oh, let's walk over there. And uh, we walk in there, and Harley's talking to Chris Bell on the phone. Just happened to be t- him talking to him on the phone at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what up? <laughs> what up, Chris Bell? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Haven't talked to him in years. Uh, Chris actually pressed some vinyl for me. Like He's got like a like a lathe kind of. Yeah. Um, not like a Neumann super lathe, but you know, he can cut some vinyl. <laughs> now, Chris, uh, so I've, I've talked to him at length, uh, especially when, uh, I was trying to get, trying to get our documentary, get this in the, you know, get this in the, uh, Academy's hands. And, and, uh, when I say the Academy, I'm talking about Naris. And, um, so Chris, Chris and I talked at length about, you know, some of the differences that are that are taking place uh, where we were, where we are, so on and so forth uh, when it comes to basically just doing business. And I expressed to him, you know, it just seems to me in some in some cases the the buggy was put before the horse, which was kind of ironic because that's how we created the documentary was like it's a great idea. Now let's go make it. Right. Which I had explained to me later on. Well, maybe that wasn't the better of the ideas that were out there. Maybe you should come up with the idea and then see if you can't sell the idea before you start spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on things. <laughs> uh, all of that being said, uh, yeah, Chris had said something to the to the nature of, look. Um, 
we in the trenches, guys that are engineers and producers, we look at the business one way. And uh, we obviously were very attached to it. We're, we love it. You know, there, there's a love there that can't be mm-hmm. necessarily explained to just anybody. You have to experience it. And he goes, that's not the way that they're doing business here where, where I'm at. And uh, I think his biggest thing, of course, I don't know if you know, but he's moved back to Texas now. Mm-hmm. He's down in... Warren Berlin. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, the biggest thing for him was, he goes, look, I've got a daughter and I don't want to raise her in Shreveport. <laughs> and I, went, I can't say as I blame you. I've got a kid in Shreveport too. Mm-hmm. He's a grown kid, but... Um, no, not, not a knocker favorite. down Shreveport. Yeah. Yeah. I've never stopped, but I've driven through it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nothing against folk in Shreveport. Uh, it's it's just not something that we're used to. And Chris was like, "Yeah, man, I'm I'm gonna make my way back to the hill country here in Texas, where, you know, where uh, I think it's fair to say that we treat things a little differently than yeah than um, I mean, where it might be treated other otherwise." That's why I moved back. <laughs> um, okay, well, let's talk about that for a second. And I, you don't have to be long-winded about it or anything of that nature, but what made you des- decide to move back to, to Texas? Because I can do this in Texas, and I cannot do this probably anywhere else for any kind of dollar amount that I would find agreeable. <laughs> okay. Um, not to pry, but is it, is it because of cost of living the other places that you were that you were living or is it more like uh you can't swing a dead cat without hitting another somebody i mean yeah all that um just you know cost of living and space and um you know i felt like i was far enough in my game that i didn't have to go like hustle up gigs in la or something like that that Mm-hmm. I had enough things happening that I didn't have to like be in that LA culture. Um, if I was a young man and trying to do this, I would probably be in LA. <laughs> okay. That that would be safe to say. Um, I've got a I've got to add to that. I've seen plenty of folk who have moved to LA as young as young men, women. Yeah. yeah. They come back yeah. fairly quick. They yeah. go, Yeah, that's yeah, I, I don't want any part of that. It's a lot going on. Yeah. <laughs> there is there is. There definitely is. And yeah, my Absolutely. friend calls it the Mecca for entertainment. No, yeah, I mean that's just so much. And um I mean, you almost have to be that guy, you know going to the studio session and wrapping a cable for some big artist and then you're next thing you, I'm on Instagram in the studio grinding yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like. no it and, and it happens I mean it happens uh, even Nashville um, once again this isn't about me and where I've been but I've had guys I've had assistants um, that have gone man I sure would love to be you. I'm going, why? Right. <laughs> I go, you realize that you're assisting on one of the biggest name people in Nashville right now. And, you know, what's wrong with that? Oh, right. uh, well, you know, uh, I'm, I'm so much better than, than wrapping a cable or I'm so much better than going and getting lunch for everybody. <laughs> oh, okay, no. well, that's... That, <laughs> That's fine, but you also need to realize that when you think no one's watching, you need to realize everyone's watching. How 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 well are you wrapping that cable, and or how well how good is your attitude while doing it? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Because it only takes one time for the guy who might be sitting in the seat that you want to take, for them to get sick or something has to you know something happens Mm -hmm. and the session has to still continue and lo and behold you're the one guy who's there right and uh you're going to be you know you're going to be put in that position fairly quick uh i mean i saw it happen 
And I, I never thought it would happen, at least not the way that it that it did. And um, without mentioning names, uh, that very thing kind of happened at the Sound Lab, where I was working on a completely different genre of of music, and I had my head totally into that because we were there for six months every day for six months and if i'm being honest about the whole thing uh it is very to say even though i was being paid very well to be there and be there with a good attitude Uh i was pretty much ready for it to be done of course just because you love it doesn't mean you can't be tired of doing it (laughs) but because someone made a mistake in this other session that was going on, I get a phone call from someone's manager going, hey, uh, what do you think about you know coming and joining us to do this? Never thought about that and never had crossed my mind. I thought you guys were self-contained, so on and so forth. And it's like, uh, well, yeah, yeah. we've kind of been watching you, you know, we've been rubbing elbows for the last several months. And so here's, you know, here's what happened. And so we kind of wondered if you would consider, and it's like, that's a no-brainer. Yeah, Yeah, I'd love to. (laughs) And so, um, you know, and it it was a great, it was a great ride while it lasted. Um, All of that to say that, um, that even, even then, I was hoping that that particular gig would go on forever and ever and ever but uh knowing also that life changes always happen you know we grow up we get married we have kids we have things we you know our interests might even change to to a certain degree Mm -hmm. um i just find it incredibly well i'll i'll go right out and say that uh you were Honestly, you were my saving grace uh, for Kirk Franklin. Yeah, shout out Kirk Franklin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, great guy, uh, great bunch of bunch of people. No, um, yeah, for sure. I remember, um, I can't remember what year it was. I want to say it was probably nineteen ninety nine. Ninety nine. Yeah. Okay, you remember it? Well. Oh yeah, I remember it. <laughs> Where. Um, the idea was for Kirk to move his camp to California. Yeah. Now, correct me if if I'm wrong about this, but... I did that for a year, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I got asked, it's like, so Tim, you know, here's, here's what the plan is. Do you want to go? And it's like, guys, I'm about to have my second child. If I were to do that, <laughs> I'm going to be divorced and, Again. and homeless. <laughs> yeah. um, as appealing as that might be, um, I'm, I'm probably not your guy. But uh, I know somebody who is perfect for this. Also, mm-hmm. this was about the same time that things were shifting from analog tape mm-hmm. into more the digital realm. Here we are. Pro Tools is beginning to pick up, do really big things. Yeah. And uh, I had mentioned, I go, so like, I don't think that you guys have met him yet, but you need to get to know him. We were... Um I was brought in when y'all were prepping stuff for the New Nation tour. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to, like, I mean, it's commonplace now, but perform with supplementing background tracks and drum machines and, um, you know, background vocals that are already recorded Mm -hmm. because choirs are, you know, difficult. They can be. uh, To, you know, make sound good live. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Yeah. That the those sessions changed my life without a doubt. Well, and and I'm not saying it to to do anything other than to just say thanks for being that guy who went, yeah, I'll take this on and I'll I'll do it gladly. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I'd asked you a little bit later on, you know how how did that go when you were out there? And my understanding is it wasn't necessarily perfect living conditions. Of course not. I mean, um, I rented a house, but 
it, I mean, the living conditions were fine. It, it was just, you know, it, I don't know. It, it changed the vibe a little bit. Um, sure. But, I mean, we had a good time. <laughs> Always had a good time. I met a ton of people. I, I mean, Kirk's Camp is a is a perfect example of you're never working for just the guy. Like, right. Kirk, Kirk Franklin's got, you know, five singers working on their own projects or, mm-hmm. you know, Bobby Sparks is doing his own thing and he knows musicians that are doing things. And so um, mm-hmm. using hindsight as kind of a, a roadmap for people in the future, like don't ever think, um, you know, it's all about one guy. Like that one guy might be connected to five other things that might be important to you later and you not know it yet <laughs> oh uh, yeah and you bring up the perfect guy bobby bobby yeah, sparks yeah. i mean to this to this day uh i i so look up to to bobby and it it's beyond his ability to be a musician it, no, it's as a human a, being he's a guy yeah. too and yeah he, he's the same you know for, from a musician standpoint he he goes out on the road and plays gigs and, mm-hmm. you know, with some really huge names. And then he comes back to Dallas and plays Brick House and <laughs> at some bar. <laughs> yep. <laughs> like, yep. No, you're absol- <laughs> absolutely, he, absolutely He does right. it because he genuinely loves it. Like, he plays the B3 organ and that's what he plays. and That's what he plays. He's, and he he's is... got a van for it. <laughs> yeah, he does. Like, I think he tried to sell me that van at one point. <laughs> Um, no, that, that is the perfect ex- example of, of, uh, what I was, what I was thinking is that, um, when it comes down to the human, the human side of things, um, so often it's, it's easy. I've, I've had, I'll go back to the students. I've had students go, oh, you, you know, I, I just think so highly of these people and they have a tendency to put them up on a pedestal, which is fine yeah, to a certain yeah. extent. Um, but without the realization that, that these are people that want to be treated like people too, you know, where yeah, yeah. they can, you Absolutely. can carry on a conversation with them just like what we're having right here. Yeah. And um, that, that having been said, um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna spit this out in in behalf of, of Bobby Sparks. He was my saving grace when I was in Los Angeles with Kirk on the New Nation project, mixing that project. Yeah. Our hotel. So I'm out there for a little over a month. Our hotel, as the crow flies, shouldn't have been more than 15 minutes away. But with LA traffic. You're talking two and a half, three hours to get back to the hotel. And this is at, you know, 6 a.m. in the morning <laughs> that after you've been up all day. No, no. it's not. I promise. <laughs> that, that's another good reason to not live there. Bobby <laughs> finds out. He's like, so, like, when when do you come back to the hotel? And I'm going, if I'm lucky, I'll, I'll get to the hotel at about 7 a.m. And this is with me yeah. leaving the studio at 4 a.m. And then I have to be up and back at it around 8 a.m. Yeah. So that I can make the 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 drive back mm-hmm. to be in place <laughs> ready to go for the next day. And he goes, "You got to be kidding me." <laughs> and I went, "No. I mean, I've just kind of accepted it as this is the way that it is." Now, once again, this isn't about me. I'm just telling a story. Yeah. But, but Bobby, when he found out about that, he went directly to Kirk and went to Jesse, and he goes, so did you know that this man has been, this guy only gets two hours of sleep every day. <laughs> Why can't y'all put him in a hotel much closer to the studio? The very next day, we had, we had, a, had a hotel that was like 10 minutes away. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, Bobby, since uh, since you spoke up and since you said something about it, you want to be my roommate while we're up here? He goes, 
Oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, I don't like that drive any more than you do. <laughs> oh, me. But we had some we had some great times with all of that. Uh, went into South Central. Uh, of course, you know Todd Parsono. Oh, yeah. Uh, probably pretty well. I, I was his roommate on the New Nation tour, so, yeah. Okay, so... <laughs> So all of that to say, we were in South Central. We had a gig. It was a live performance in South Central. And we were in a big old 15-passenger van. I'm not real sure who the, who the drummer was at the time, but he was driving the van. And, of course, Todd and I were sitting in the back of the van. Now, if you can imagine, we probably had about eight or nine people in the van, and here Todd and I are both. And the drummer, he's driving through there, and there's cops on about every other street corner. <laughs> he goes, oh, Lord, we're driving through South Central, and I got two white guys in the back of the van. And I go, yeah, and if we get pulled over, I don't know any of you guys. <laughs> it was hilarious. It was absolutely hilarious. But it will also be the times that I remember incredibly, incredibly well. I'll take it to the grave <laughs> of, of those times. But the, the experience that we have also, talking about Bobby, um, so Kirk had a, had a little get-around car uh, while, while there, and occasionally I would get to have the keys to it, which mm. was awesome. It was great. And I remember distinctly Bobby sitting in the passenger side, and we're on Sunset Sunset Strip, and we're driving through, and I'm just, you know, I'm taking in all the sights, and Bobby never gets excited, or he never seems to get excited yeah. about anything. <laughs> he goes, you're about to hit the cop in front of us. And I'm going, oh, and this nice, you know, and he goes, Tim, you're about to hit the cop in front of us. I look up, and I mean, I just darn near, you know, slammed into the back end of a of a cop car. <laughs> and I'm going, Bobby, it's okay to get excited from, from, you know, every once in a while. It's okay to yell at me. <laughs> He's like, ah, uh, you know. If it happens, it happens. It. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was a lot of fun. Well, listen, um, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I appreciate you, Chris, for taking the time to kind of talk to us. Let me ask you this. Is there anything, if you were to, um, if you were to be set behind a podium and you were talking to anybody who might be aspiring to get into the recording industry, into the, uh, into the biz, is there anything that you would tell those people? Um, I would say listen to as much music as you can get your hands on. Um, don't worry about genre or not liking a specific genre or um, anything like that because if you gain an appreciation for music in general, genre like shouldn't matter to you. Um, I mean, Kirk is another perfect example. Like you would think, oh, well, I don't like gospel music. Um, so, so <laughs> there, right. there's a million reasons to, to do gospel music. Sure. Um, there's other people involved. Yeah. That might lead you to the genre of music that you do want to work on. Um, mm -hmm. And it is really all about taste. And if you can think about mixing a song or making a piece of music from, you know, the perspective of somebody that does enjoy that genre of music. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got a, you've got a leg up big time. You're not just um, making rap beats on your laptop. You're, you, you know, it's much bigger than that. And like, I, I would say get some mu some music theory in you. If you're not musical, like know what key signatures are. Um, auto tune is like a huge thing now, of course. Like know how to, you know, um, know what key you're in without having to use some kind of app to tell you what the key is. Because A, they're not always right. 
And B, like, if you actually know something about key signatures, that might look to somebody else like you know what you're doing. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, and you just never know when when those little things are going to mean something. Um, I can look at where I've gotten now, not knowing what I was doing at the time, because I definitely did not, but knowing what I know now, everything that happened for me happened through developing relationships with, with people um, and collaborating with different people along the way. It, it was never, I'm doing this and going forward it, it was I'm doing this with these people sometimes that would branch out and to include some other people and then some different people and mm -hmm. um, it really is more about developing relationships and being likable um, being accountable being available and caring passionately about whatever it is you're working on regardless of you like the genre of music or not that's mm -hmm. like down here in the list of things that are important um i would never just be like oh well i'm going to do this uh, it you don't really know what you're going to do honestly <laughs> so, right yeah um find other talented people to surround yourself with if you are a student you know just trying to do your own thing uh, you know do that um, if you're trying to branch out and, you know, work with all kinds of different things, um, where was I going with that? <laughs> well, you were you just basically stating what I think, um, we yeah. all should keep in mind. And that is, is that it, it, it's a more about the human, human side of things right. and, and, relationships with people uh, as opposed to and I, I think it's well said on on your behalf that it's not about it's not about the gear so much no it's not like gear is tools there's there's people that I've seen that they get every single cracked plug-in available and they load up their laptops with all this crap and they don't really know how to use any of it um, I I would say don't ever crack a piece of software in your life if you can avoid it. Um, things, the, the prices have come so far down. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so, like, you don't need to do that. You're building a house of cards and, like, you're building a mentality that, that just doesn't really further what you're trying to do when you're just collecting cracked plugins on your Pro Tools rig and, you know, then your computer crashes and then what? Um, yeah. Like, you can really mix a song with stock plugins. Like, we mixed songs with way less. Like, people mm -hmm. see the, the board and whatever and think, that's actually less than what Pro Tools is at this point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Uh, no, no, abso absolutely right. Um, I, I have one last thing that I would kind of throw in there to that. It, it came to... And this has come up on other podcasts as well, but I was invited over to uh, Henley's place. This has been years ago now too, and uh, they, when when I was invited, they expressed to me, "Hey, look, he's got the you know he's got the D command here. He's got all everything that you could possibly ever want." Mm -hmm. And I walked in, and this kind of goes back to the shortcuts type stuff. I first of all, we were cutting vocals. What microphone does he want to use? Um, and then we were doing some guitar, guitar lead riffs that that were gonna go on the album. And when I walked in, uh, I made mention in this earlier that, uh, wow, you know, this is a great place for me to set my lap laptop on top of. I ain't gonna <laughs> use any of that. <laughs> We've got a right. microphone, got a great preamp right. sitting right over here. You. We're capturing <laughs> vocals. Uh, yeah, we can call it a day. Right. Are you using the desk? Yes. As a desk. As a desk. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's that's one of the things that uh, I definitely, you know, I, I tell a lot of, and I'm going to call them kids. Most of them are kids. 
uh, at least, you know, when you're at the age that I'm at now, they're, they're younger than my kids <laughs> are. So I guess I will call them kids. There's but, a Timberland quote that if I can quote him one time, he's like, we need to stop calling these kids, kids, man. <laughs> what are we on a fishing trip? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I've always I've always loved him anyway. No, he was funny. But um yeah, I mean I, I, I try to influence these guys. Look, if you're gonna invest a bunch of money in something, invest it in maybe hardware. Maybe it should be microphones or maybe it should be, you know, a, a kick uh, mic pre or something that right, is going right. to stand the test of time. Of it's going to be with you for years and years and years as yeah, opposed yeah. to, you know, and, and you speak the truth, you know, any cracked this or that, it's it, it's a house of cards at that point. And when mm-hmm. when things go wrong, they go very, very wrong. Oh, yeah, for sure. So I'm, I'm, I'm definitely on board with all of that. And, you know, I would say I used to be a part of that that little group. It's like, oh, I need to get as many of these really cool plugins, and they cost a whole bunch of money. So I'll just go over yeah. here, and then it happened. You I, know, I can't mm-hmm. afford them, so I'll steal them. Yeah, like, is that and are are you gonna go to Home Depot and steal a hammer? Like, right, <laughs> and that's a great analogy. That's um, a great analogy, and for, you don't even really need it, honestly. Like, you don't. I mean. Sure, like I, I've got a ton of plugins. I'm, I'm not gonna sit here and act like I don't have a shitload of plugins, <laughs> but um, that's because I have a problem. <laughs> well, we probably all have that problem no, too, I mean, for what it's worth. That just comes from getting sent sessions from all over the place and um, as set in my ways as I can get. Um, I'm my mind is always open to see what somebody else did, sure. You sure. Know, like maybe there's a plugin in there session that I've never even thought about using, and then I'm like, oh, well, let me look that and see what that was doing. I got called out the other day for, for uh, playlist. What's the shortcut for playlist? Uh, I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> playlist. Oh, yeah. oh, the uh, a- Apple. Uh, yeah. So it's yeah. command, command, control, control, command, uh, left arrow. Uh, non-technical, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. Well, listen, man, we're going to wrap it up and get out of your hair for the day. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your day to talk with us. And uh, um, once again, this is, I, I wanted to create this stuff to drive traffic to some of the other things that we're eventually going to be doing, which is going to be exploring artists. Uh, these are these are folks that no one really knows about. Mm-hmm. Um my eyes have been open to lots of really cool people out there that uh, just looking at them, you know, face value, meeting yeah, them yeah. for the first time you <laughs> go, I never had an idea that, you know, you were some big badass on piano, for example. Right. So we've got one coming up uh, later on in this month, uh, phase two of, of what AKB is all about. And uh, I discovered this guy of all places at church. And uh, this guy, he, he's, in the, he's on the technical side on a day-in, day-out type thing. But I had the luxury of, um, he didn't know it, but he got on the piano one, one afternoon when he thought no one else was in the building. Little did he know I was sitting in another building watching everything that he was doing. Mm. And, of course, got to hear it. And I went, oh, my Wowie, wow, wow. This is this is unbelievable. So really what we're what we're about to explore is uh folk who don't really have a platform to promote themselves. And what AK, AKB is what we're all about is exploring those areas and letting people know, you know, it's it's more about human beings being able yeah. to communicate with one another. Um, and with an understanding that we're not working against one another, it's not a race. Um, I guess what I'm really trying to say is, is that I've got my race that I'm running. You've got your race that you're running. Robert's got his, Sterling's got his, John's got his, Mm -hmm. and we're all able to collaborate with one another on a very friendly, uh, basis because we're friends. First and foremost, we're friends and there's, 
really very few things that I can ever imagine uh, not being able to talk with my friends about. Right. You know, how, hey man, how did you how did you pull this off? And it used to not be that way. Uh, I remember the days of like, look, I'm going to show you. Sterling brought this up. Uh, I remember the days of, I'm going to show you this, but you keep that right here. It doesn't need to be. You know, you don't need to. You don't need to share that with others. And it's no longer that way. And no, I'm, I'm very thankful for that. That's not at all. Very thankful for that. Well, listen, we're going to wrap it up, folks. This is AKB. We're sounding out. All right. Peace. Mm-hmm. Goodbye. Thanks. Your turn. Peace. Your turn. (laughs) Peace.